following the explosion of the so-called grunge movement from the Pacific Northwest in the early 90s, a new generation of bands would sprout up. One of those groups would be Everclear, and they would go on to have commercial success in the mid-90s to early 2000s. Today, because you guys requested it, we're going to take a look at the history of Everclear. I want to thank today's sponsor, World of Warships, for sponsoring this video. World of Warships is a free-to-play multiplayer game based around naval warfare. The best parts of the game are the monthly updates that give you new ships, in-game nations, cosmetics, and ship classes. The game has also done some really cool collaborations, including teaming up with a band that I've covered a lot on this channel, which is Megadeth. The game features a band-themed ship, as well as music from the group, and even frontman Dave Mustaine does some voiceovers for the game as well. To date, the developers have added about 500 ships over 10 different nations. If you couple this with the dynamic weather effects, you're always going to experience something new each time you boot up the game. World of Warships features a whopping 40 maps with multiple different ship classes, including battleships, destroyers, aircraft carriers or cruisers, and submarines. The game is a very active and engaged community, and you can be part of that too. Starting this month, all active World of Warships players will have access to the exclusive Captain's Club, where you can get discounts and offers from the game's partners. The game is available for both the PC and consoles. If you guys are interested in checking the game out, use the link in the description box below. And specifically for you guys, the viewers of Rock and Roll True Stories, you can use the promo code BRAVO to receive a massive starter pack which includes 500 doubloons, 1.5 million credits, 7 days of premium account time, and a ship. Art Alexakis would be born and raised in Santa Monica, California in a housing project. His father would split by the age of 6, and he and his four siblings would be raised by their mother. He would, however, see his dad every so often, and even lived with his dad for a few months when he was a teenager, but emotionally, he wasn't there. Art's childhood was pretty downright awful, and the band's second album, Sparkle and Fade, would show a photo of Art when he was just nine years old, with a big smile. The LA Times would write about that photo. The reason for the playful expression, they'd ask, he just smoked pot for the first time. Art would take up drinking by the time he was eight years old, and at age 12, he nearly died of a cocaine overdose at his friend's house. His friend's neighbor just happened to be a medic and saved his life. When he turned 13, he started using heroin to deal with the pain of his parents' divorce and other issues he was dealing with as a child. Art's 15-year-old girlfriend and his brother would both die of overdoses only a week apart. And when he was a teenager, things got so dire for him that he almost contemplated ending his life by jumping off the Santa Monica Pier with weights in his pocket. It was in the 70s, he was in high school, and around 14 to 15, he started playing guitar and attended Santa Monica High where his classmates included Emilio Estevez and Sean Penn. It was now 1989 and Art decided that he was finally done with drugs and alcohol and he moved to San Francisco. He would recall to the LA Times, I was just miserable. I looked at my life and I wasn't doing anything. I felt like I was better than what I had become. During his early days in San Francisco, he was working as a production coordinator for a graphics art company and it would be one of his co-workers who got him a job running a small label called Shindig Records, where he would even put together a compilation album of the city's cowpunk bands. Art was also playing in a group called Colorfinger, which Shindig put out a release from. Colorfinger would actually generate some controversy in the local music scene when they released a song called Kill Jerry Garcia. Art would tell the Sunday News, I don't buy into the peace, love, and dope thing. Most deadheads are just white bread rich kids. They're too happy, hairy, and gross. Shindig, however, would run into financial trouble by the early 90s, and now Art was out of a job. It was during his time in San Francisco he met a record store clerk named Jenny Dodson. The couple dated, and she soon got pregnant. The couple would relocate to Dodson's hometown of Portland, and Art would tell the Oregonian years later that the cost of living, access to medical care, and the school system was part of their decision to relocate further north. With being a father on the horizon, Art had to decide whether it was time for him to get a real job, or continue to pursue his musical dream. So he decided to start one more band. He'd put out an ad in the paper, The Rocket, that read, and I quote, looking for bass player and drummer to form a band. Influences include Pixies, Sonic Youth, X, Neil Young, Led Zeppelin. That ad would be answered by bass player Craig Montoya and a drummer named Scott Cuthbert. It was now 1991 and the group's first rehearsal would happen when Art's daughter was only four days old. Montoya would recall to spin how taken aback he was by Art's personality, recalling, 
I answered the ad and had to hold the receiver away from my ear. He was so excited. He wanted to go on the road. He wanted to record an album. He wanted to go down to South by Southwest and the new music seminar and the CMJ. And I was like, wow, I've never been outside of the Pacific Northwest. The trio soon called themselves Everclear, a reference to the infamous grain alcohol. But those initial rehearsals didn't really go well, but the band kept practicing and they kept playing shows. And they started to improve. The trio soon hit the studio with $400, resulting in the Nervous and Weird EP and the band's first full-length album, World of Noise, both of which came out in 1993. Everclear's early sound would be described as a combination of both punk and grunge. Their first two releases would be distributed by Portland's Tim Kerr Records. With themes ranging from AIDS to domestic assault to homelessness, it wasn't exactly a feel-good record. but. It became a hit in Portland, and soon enough Everclear were headlining shows in the city. But outside of Portland, the label didn't really do much to promote the album, so Art would take it upon himself, he would attend alternative music conferences, he personally hired people to get the album played on college radio, where it had some success, and he sent out the mailouts for promo albums himself. It was this determination and hard work that led the band to getting noticed by record labels. They soon played a showcase for them in Los Angeles. There was now a bidding war between 30 labels. But when Art brought up how he wanted to produce his own records and have total creative control, in addition to being able to sign bands for the label as a talent scout, the list of interested labels soon narrowed down to seven. Everclear would sign with Capitol Records in the summer of 1994, and soon enough labels started scouring Portland for the next Everclear. Despite being sober for about half a decade by this point, Art was still dealing with his own demons. He would tell BandwagMag.com, I'm an addict so I put my energy into sex, power, anger, control, everything. Still did that after I got sober in 1989. It would foreshadow the volatility of the band going forward. It was prior to finalizing the recording contract that Cuthbert was kicked from the band, apparently for improvising too much during live shows. But in press interviews that Art did, he would tell MTV that Cuthbert was kicked out for smoking pot, violating the band's sobriety rule. That created issues for the drummer, who was now trying to become a school teacher later on in his career. Greg Eklund was added to the lineup. With a new drummer in tow, the band would begin working on their second record, 1995 Sparkle and Fade. With $85,000 in their pocket, they would go to Butch Vig's studio in Madison, Wisconsin. Vig was working in the studio at the same time with a new band he had called Garbage. Sparkle and Fade in the press would sometimes be referred to as Art's heroin album, with the track Heroin Girl frequently being brought up in conversation, but he would push back against those assertions, telling the Red Deer Advocate, deals with my daughter and the breakup that I went through, aspects of dealing with depression and anxiety and stuff like that. The album which was released in 1995 did decent out of the gate, but not great. The lead single Heroin Girl would be about Art's deceased girlfriend and his brother. When the policeman found Art's brother, the officer reportedly said, just another overdose, which made its way into the song's lyrics. The track would get some play on MTV's 120 Minutes and also on the alternative airplay charts, but it would be the track Santa Monica that really took off. It topped the mainstream rock tracks chart and peaked at number 29 on the Hot 100 chart. Art would talk to Song Facts about Santa Monica saying, I grew up in a seaside town called Santa Monica, which is like LA, but on the coast. I've lived in cold places and been in bad relationships, and I think everybody has a place in their mind that is like a safe haven. It's about getting away from bad times. It was by Christmas of 95 the song got added to MTV's Busbin program, and the album soon went gold and later platinum. The record also had another hit in the song Heart Spark Dollar Sign, a commentary on interracial relationships. Art would admit to the Kansas City star that he once dated a black girl, and when he told his mom, she told him that his girlfriend wasn't welcome in their home. One thing I noticed about the band when you read a lot of the articles from the time they were coming up is that Everclear couldn't escape the comparisons to Nirvana. They were all over the place, as you guys can see in some of these newspaper articles. Art would respond to these comparisons telling Louder Sound, I understand the Nirvana comparison, of course. Blonde haired singer, three piece band screaming from the Northwest. I understand it, but it seemed like a lot of writers used that comparison as a way to attack us, like we were deliberately trying to copy Nirvana, which was nonsense. With the success of Everclear's second record, some publications were hailing the band along with Foo Fighters and presidents of the United States of America for reigniting interest in the Pacific Northwest music scene. However, that's not to say that people in Portland were necessarily happy about Everclear's success, because a lot of them were not. One member of the music scene interviewed by Spin Magazine 
seemed to pick on Art's violent behavior, his ambition, his business and management style. Others would claim that he embellished details of his childhood and personal life simply for fame. Even when Spin Magazine prominently featured Everclear on the front of one of their mid-90s issues, the writer who did the story was inundated with documents which were given to him from Portland's music scene. These documents pertain to Art's domestic violence arrest and welfare fraud charge from a few years prior. He would tell an interviewer to have people digging back into my past on incidents and faxing police reports of things I did four or five years ago when I was so poor that I couldn't afford to be on antidepressants. I was on welfare with my kid. My relationship with Jenny was dicey at the time. People with an agenda can make that into something a lot more. The band's follow-up record, 1997, So Much for the Afterglow, would see Art write a much harder album that was originally titled Pure White Evil. He would end up sending the recordings to his A&R guy at Capitol Records, who thought the album was good, but not great. So Art would relocate to New York for a couple weeks with just himself and his acoustic guitar, and he would come up with several new tunes, and they went back and remixed the whole record. The album would contain three of Everclear's biggest hits, including Father of Mine, I Will Buy You a New Life, and Everything to Everyone all of which were top five hits on the alternative rock chart. Father of Mine would be inspired by Art's daughter when he recalled watching her sleep one night thinking how anyone could abandon a child. He would go back to his office and pen the track about his own dad. So much for the afterglow outsold his predecessor going double platinum and the album's success only further cemented Art's title as one of the most hated musicians for Portland. You could tell though that the band was getting tired of life on the road and just being in each other's presence for such a long period of time. They gave one interview to the Empton Journal where they came out and said that they were going to do two more albums and then call it quits. You have to remember that Art got his big break later on in life when he was in his mid-30s. He discussed in the interview how he wanted to start his own record label and work more behind the scenes in the music industry. The tour to support their third record also came with some issues. There was one show in Boston that saw several members of the New England Patriots, including quarterback Drew Bledsoe, stage dive and land on a 23-year-old woman in the crowd, severely injuring her back. The Patriots players, along with the venue and even Everclear the band, would be sued by the woman. She would end up getting a $1.25 million settlement out of court. Fast forward to a show in Australia where Art got into a brawl with the band's bass player and it was rumored that Everclear had broken up and they scrapped a bunch of tour dates. The band would end up soldiering on and it was following that tour, Art wanted to do a solo project with more experimental sounds like R&B and do something that was a little bit different than what Everclear were known for but the idea would be scrapped at the insistence of his record label and management who begged him to just do another Everclear album, which he did. Initially, he envisioned putting out a double album, but the label balked at the idea since it was a pretty risky move. Instead, they suggested the band release two separate records a few months apart. Everclear would return in 2000 with songs from an American movie Volume 1, as well as Volume 2. Volume 1 would end up doing pretty well going platinum with a few hit singles including Wonderful and AM Radio. Wonderful would be another autobiographical song, with Art being a child of divorce, as was his daughter. Volume 2, meanwhile, was a harder sounding album, and it proved to be a huge commercial disappointment, only peaking at number 66 on the Billboard charts. It's possible that the lack of commercial singles contributed to the album's performance. Art would admit on the band's YouTube channel that Volume 2 sounded tired due to a lot of bad stuff that was happening in his life. While he was sober during this time, he would admit to cheating on his wife, resulting in him getting divorced. The same issues that plagued Volume 2 would carry over to the band's subsequent album, 2003 Slow Motion Daydream. The record would spell the end of the classic lineup of Everclear. Only five months after its release, Craig Montoya and Greg Eklund left the band, and Art would admit to the Morning Call newspaper that the decision to part ways was mutual. While the exact details of their split isn't really known, Eklund did do an AMA on Reddit where he said the following, Everclear, it was always Art's band. His songs, you have to ask the guys who play with them now whether or not they're in the band or hired guns. I know a lot of guys who have played in the band after Craig and I left. Eventually, they all leave for the same reasons as Craig and I did. Following the dissolution of the classic lineup, Art would hit a string of bad luck. He soon got divorced again. He hit some financial trouble declaring bankruptcy. His mother passed away and he was trying to get out of his recording contract with Capitol Records. He would admit to Howard Stern in a 2012 interview that he had the wrong people managing his money, and at one point he owed over $2 million to the IRS. He would later have to sell his publishing for about $600,000. 
Since the mid-2000s, though, Art has remained as the only constant band member in Everclear, and he's had a revolving lineup of musicians play with him. Everclear has put out several subsequent records with their latest studio recording coming in 2015. This past year, they put out a live show from the Whiskey A Go Go, and in 2012, Art would launch the annual Summerland Tour, which features Everclear, of course, and a number of nostalgic acts from the 90s. Sadly, in 2019, Art would reveal that he's been diagnosed as having multiple sclerosis. As for his father, he would reveal in that 2012 Howard Stern interview, it was during the time his mother got cancer and just before she passed, he asked his father to call her and apologize for everything he has put her through, but he never did. He'd reveal in the same interview that his father ended up marrying another woman after leaving his own family and had two kids with her, which he ended up raising. Art's dad would end up passing away sometime in 2016, around the time of David Bowie's death. He'd remarked to band Rag Meg, I was more upset about David Bowie's death than I was about my own father. My father died a few days before Bowie. I felt like I knew more about Bowie and learned more from him than I did from my own dad. Bowie was a constant in my life, he'd say. That does it for today's video, guys. Thanks for watching. And guys, don't forget to check out World of Warships using the link in the description box below and the promo code BRAVO to receive a massive starter pack, which consists of 500 doubloons, 1.5 million credits, 7 days of premium account time, and a ship. Thanks for watching, guys, and we'll see you again on Rock and Roll Tree Stories.